The Dr. Taz Show. The podcast, Dr. Taz. Superwoman Wellness. Here's Dr. Taz. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Superwoman Wellness, where you know on every episode of this show, I am determined to bring you back to your superpowered self. And you are in for a treat today. Joining me today is Dr. Stephen Gundry. Now, I know you've heard about him and all his amazing work but you may not know his background. I just found out, for example, that we went to the same medical school. So how exciting is that? It's a fellow Medical College of Georgia graduate, but he's got a very diverse, very diverse bio. And I want you to know just a little bit of it because this guy is a brainiac and he just told me he's still seeing patients about seven days a week. So incredible. But he's a cum laude graduate of Yale University with honors in human biological and social evolution. He graduated Alpha Omega Alpha, which is the highest honor, by the way, from the Medical College of Georgia School of Medicine. He's completed residencies in general surgery and thoracic surgery. He's invented devices that reverse cell death seen in acute heart attack attacks, which have become the world's most widely used device of its kind to protect the heart from damage during open heart surgery. He pioneered the field of xenotransplantation. Do you sleep? Oh my goodness. <laughs> in 2001, he was inspired by the stunning reversal of coronary artery disease in an inoperable patient using a combination of dietary changes and nutraceutical supplements, and that changed his career. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gundry. Thank you, Dr. Taz, fellow MCG graduates. Great yes. to be with you. Well, I am thrilled to have you on, and I uh, don't know whether to be happy to have you on or to curse you because I don't have a patient that doesn't come into the office every day and shows me your book, The Plant Paradox, and asks me what I think about lectins. I think you are solely responsible for the word lectin appearing now in everybody's yeah. vernacular. So talk to us. This is an incredible, by the way, all jokes aside, this is an incredible medical journey and a very accomplished career. And it is, you know, one of some of my best friends are surgeons and they haven't quite bought on to all of this quite yet. What, what transpired this transition for you from surgery to the world of nutraceuticals and how in the world did you stumble on lectins? So um, I'll, I'll try to make it, it short. Um, my, my major at Yale back in the dark ages, we could design our own major. And so I, you had to do a thesis. And the thesis was you could take a great ape, manipulate its food supply, manipulate its environment, and prove you derive it a human being. And I researched that for four years and defended my thesis and got an honors, as you mentioned. And I, I gave it to my parents and went off to become a world famous heart surgeon. Mm -hmm. And uh, among other things, you know, my partner Leonard Bailey and I pioneered infant uh, pediatric heart transplantation and xeno transplantation. And I became very famous for taking on patients uh, who nobody else wanted to mm -hmm. operate on. And there were a few of us still are that will do that. So, uh, Back in the late 19, 1990s, I was referred to a guy from Miami by the name of Big Ed, that's what I call him, who was a huge gentleman. He's 48 years old, had inoperable coronary artery disease. Everything's clogged up. Couldn't put stents in it, couldn't do bypass, Big Ed. And Big Ed had been to multiple centers, spending six months going to each center and being turned down. And part of the process is they usually end up in my office at Loma Linda University. Mm -hmm. uh, and he uh, showed me his angiogram from six months earlier in Miami. And I looked at his angiogram. I said, you know, I don't like to turn people down, but I agree with everybody else. There's nothing I'm going to do for you. And he said, well, here's the deal. I've, I've been on a diet for the last six months. I've lost 45 pounds. I went to a health food store. I bought this big bag of supplements that I'm taking. And he actually brought it in with him. And he says, you know, maybe I did something in here. And you know, I'm scratching my professor beard saying, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but it's not going to do anything in here. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine, which mm -hmm. I firmly Classic believe. Classic line, yep. And so he said, well, yeah, come on. What would it hurt? Let's get another angiogram. So we did. And in six months' time, this guy had cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his coronary artery. Wow. Gone. And, you know, I was so impressed that, uh, you know, I started asking him, okay, you know, tell me about this diet. And 
I was interested because I was a big fat guy myself, even though I was running 30 miles a week, doing mm -hmm. 5K, 10Ks on the weekends, going to the gym one hour every day, eating a very healthy uh, low Melinda diet, which was very heavily plant-based. Right. And I had high blood pressure, pre-diabetes. I had such bad arthritis. I wore braces on my knees to run and migraine headaches when I did baby heart transplants, not recommended. And he starts telling me this diet and about, I don't know, two sentences in, you know, I go, wait a minute, time out. I said, this is actually what I researched at Yale on the ancestral human diet. Huh. And and then I said, well, let me look at these supplements. So I'm going through the bag of supplements. And like you mentioned, I'm, I'm very famous for protecting the heart during heart surgery and for protecting the heart for heart transplants. And I would put a combination of, for lack of a better word, I hate the word, antioxidants in these solutions that I would put down the veins and arteries of the heart to protect mm -hmm. them. And lo and behold, Big Ed is swallowing a bunch of these things. And, you know, it never occurred to me to swallow them. So I decided to work on myself first and uh, I lost 50 pounds my first year wow. and uh, all these things went away. My blood pressure normalized, my cholesterol normalized, my insulin resistance went away, I just went away. So I started treating my patients that I operated on with the idea that okay, I'm going to operate on you. I'm going to fix whatever, you know, your coronaries, but here's how you're going to stay away from me in the future. And, and after about this, I had a, a bad moment one Friday morning looking in the mirror on the way to work before I went to work saying, I've got this all wrong. I shouldn't operate on them and then teach them how to avoid me. I should teach them how to eat and then they'll, I won't ever have to operate. Yes. Yeah. And, and now that's really dumb for a heart surgeon, even an academic heart surgeon, um, because you don't make a very good income. Um, right. <laughs> right. It's a lot to eat. There's not a lot of money in. Uh, and I take, I take Medicare, I take Medi-Cal, uh, you know, I take insurance, mm -hmm. and there's just not a lot to do. But anyhow, so I resigned my position as chairman and, head and professor of cardiac Wow. Yeah. And just, you know, moved down the road to Palm Springs from Loma Linda and set up a clinic mm -hmm. where all I asked people to do is I wanted to tell them which foods to eat, not eat. And I wanted to send them to Costco or Trader Joe's or the health food store to get some supplements. And every three months I wanted to draw a bunch of blood insurance would pay for and see what they did. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, you could detect patterns very easily. And, uh, you know, I wrote my first book back in 2007, Dr. Gundry's Pollution, and all of a sudden lots of people with autoimmune diseases started showing up on my doorstep. And because I had mentioned that a few remissions and cures, and people would come in and say, what do you know about autoimmune disease? And I'd go, I know absolutely nothing about autoimmune disease, but... I know a lot about transplant immunology. I like to fool the immune system, and I'm really good at fooling the immune system of one species to accept another species, xenotransplantation. So if you want to play, uh, I, I understand, at least I think I do, how the immune system works. So about 70% of my practice is now autoimmune disease yep. patients. Um, a heart surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> who, it's like, really? So, um, so as, as we looked into what people were reacting to, uh, I kept coming back to the fact that we essentially were a great ape that ate lots of leaves and then Quite frankly, we eat lots of tubers, and we certainly ate a lot of fish and shellfish, but that's a whole other story. And then 10,000 years ago, our diet dramatically changed with the addition of grains and beans, which had previously been inedible for 
reasons because they contain lectins. Mm, there which it are, is. There's there the word. It, <laughs> it came through. So. Which are plant proteins <laughs> that are designed by the plant to protect itself from being eaten. And there are plenty of defenses of the plant that I talk about. But lectins are not new. Um, lectins were discovered in the mid to late 1800s, and we blood type people with lectins. Yes. Hmm. And certainly, Dr. D'Amato of the blood type yeah. diet, certainly, his diet was very interesting. He knew a great deal about lectins, and I applaud him for that. But rather than kind of get people's attention on lectins, he did the blood type diet, and I won't tell you why he's really doing that, but lectins were really not uh, a forefront of what he talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's too bad because uh, he knew that lectin were a huge part of this. And, and I guess um, looking at the literature and looking at my, my research, Gail, I, it was actually very clear that lectins were a mischief maker that I should focus more attention to. And so tell, talk more, to us. Yeah, you know, for somebody out there who's who's joining us, and I'm with Dr. Gundry, guys, in case you didn't realize that, and we are talking about his career and about lectins specifically, but how would you define a lectin? Simply a plant protein, and what are the most common sources of lectin? And I probably have a third question, but let's, let's answer those first before okay. I keep going. Yeah, so lectins are proteins. They are sometimes categorized as sticky proteins because they are looking for sugar molecules to bind to. And those sugar molecules have actually unique positions in animals. Uh, for instance, they line the surface, they line the surface of our airways, our mucous membranes. They line the surface of blood vessels, which is one of the reasons I got interested in, in them in the first place in actually transplantation, but that's another story. They line the surface of our joints. They also line the wow. gap between our nerves, between one nerve and another. And the theory is, and I think it's right, that plants don't want to be eaten and they want to dissuade their predator from eating them and their babies. And they equip themselves, and more importantly, their seeds, with lectins that have the ability, if they get to the right place, and we can talk about how they get to the right place now, they're very capable of causing leaky gut. In fact, mm. Dr. Fasano from Johns mm -hmm. Hopkins proved the mechanism that gluten, which is a lectin, uh, causes leaky gut by, you know, liberonulin and then breaking tight junctions. And so lectins are one of the major causes of leaky gut. They're, once they get through the gut wall, uh, I've published papers that they are a major cause of atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease. Other papers have shown they're a major cause of kidney disease, arthritis, and certainly they are a major cause of autoimmune diseases through what's called molecular mimicry, mm -hmm. which was first proposed by Lauren Cordain from Colorado State years ago. And I, you know, the more we learn of how the immune system recognizes foreign proteins, the more I'm convinced and have published data that removal of lectins from the diet can put most autoimmune diseases into remission. Wow. My clinic, 94%. That's amazing. Oh. And, you know, I run, I joke that I run an autoimmune clinic as well, because so much of what comes through, not just your standard autoimmune diseases, but even what the children are going through, <clears throat> excuse me, but even what we're seeing in pediatrics today with all the sensory issues, all the neuroinflammatory issues, pandas, these are all diseases of the immune system going haywire. Correct. And the heroic efforts to try to solve and put the immune system back together, to tone it down, to shut it off, the use of biologics, like all this stuff that we're doing. You know, if you're not familiar with lectins and you're listening to us, what, Dr. Gedry, would you say are the top five foods that are, that we kind of need to have programmed that these are high lectin foods? So... Uh, all grains, with the exception of sorghum and millet and probably teff, 
huh. uh, have lectins. The reason those three don't is that those three grains don't have hulls. And for the most part, lectins are in the hull on the outside of a grain. So even healthy grains like quinoa or buckwheat are actually loaded with lectins. Wheat, rye, and barley have lutein, which mm -hmm. is a lectin, which is on the inside of the grain, not on the outside. One of the big mischief makers is wheat germ agglutinin, which is mm -hmm. an extremely tiny lectin that can actually go through the wall of the gut without breaking uh, the gut uh, barrier. And we're seeing an epidemic of wheat germ agglutinin problems because people actually think that whole wheat is good for good them. For you. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was growing up, uh, we smartly threw the whole wheat away and the whole grain away because that's where the lectins are. For instance, rice. Everybody thinks that brown rice is good for you, but four billion people use rice as their bowl, and most of them take the hull off of rice and eat it white. Mm. Four billion people can't be that stupid. Right. Um, one of the things that has impressed me with more advanced testing is that most of my people who are gluten intolerant, 70% of them will react to the proteins in corn. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them actually will react to the corn wheat uh, epitope, which, which when they corn, their immune system thinks they're eating wheat. Um, there's now a new uh, lectin in corn called the cry protein, which is in GMO corn. Mm. And almost all corn in the United States is GMO. Right. And so we now have a brand new lectin that we made um, that uh, we react to. Uh, the other, other myth makers are the bean family. Mm -hmm. Now, before everybody jumps and says, oh my God, gosh, Dr. Gunn, anti-bean, I am not anti-bean. You can defuse the lectins in most foods with a pressure cooker. And I think that the modern pressure cooker is probably one of the greatest inventions of all time, certainly in my patients, because you can detoxify lectins uh, in beans. And if you don't want to get a pressure cooker, there's a company that I have no affiliation with, Eden Beans, E-D-E-N, mm -hmm. that pressure cooks their beans. They actually soak their beans before, and they're in non-BPA cans. So what's not the like? I have probably six cans at any one time in my pantry. Um, so beans are a bit mystery maker. The nightshade family, potatoes, eggplant. Tomatoes, tomatoes, bell peppers, goji berries are actually a nutshade. Uh, usually the lectins are in the peels and the skin and the seeds. So you can peel and de-seed your tomatoes, peel and de-seed your peppers and make them perfectly safe. So uh, this uh, host of autoimmune diseases that you're seeing in clinic, do you take your patients off these foods? Is that yep. your first step? And I give them a yes and no page and stop eating these things. Here's the things you can have. And for, for most of my autoimmune disease patients in, in general, they almost always have low vitamin Ds. Um, and I am very, very aggressive with vitamin D uh, replacement, vitamin mm -hmm. D3. I don't stop until I have people's vitamin D levels of at least 100 to 120. Um, I have yet to see now in 21 years of practice of this vitamin D toxicity. And I have patients who routinely run their vitamin D levels at 270 mm -hmm. nanograms per milliliter. They don't have high calcium levels. They don't have kidney stones. I just haven't seen it. Um, so that's your goal is to replace it to that level up into the 270s? Or? No, my goal is to get them to 100 to 120. 100. Okay. I, yeah, I okay. won't mind some of my folks. I'll push up to 150. Uh, but that's number one uh, that I aggressively replace with all of my autoimmune patients. And I have some of these tough um, autoimmune neuropathy patients like your ALS and your Parkinson's mm -hmm. and yep. those guys. Um, you know, have you seen this work for that group too? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I have a big Parkinson's and ALS practice and, uh, and dementia practice. Uh, what I think, and 
Dale Bredesen, mm -hmm. who wrote The End of Alzheimer's, and I have become good friends, as well as uh, David Perlmeyer. Mm -hmm. I think most, the three of us, and certainly others, are convinced more and more that all of these have an underlying causation of leaky gut and or leaky mouth or mm -hmm. leaky nose. And uh, with some of our newer testing looking for leaky brain, yeah. you can absolutely see the correlation uh, between the two. And, you know, we should have known this. Hippocrates said 2,500 years ago that all disease begins in the gut. Yes. And boy, was he smart. Um, yeah. Chinese medicine, 5,000 years ago. They were all over this stuff. Yeah. But you gained a lot of notoriety and, and attention when Kelly Clarkson came out and talked about her experience with, I don't think it was just autoimmune disease, if I know the story correctly, but more with weight loss, correct? Yeah, it was both. She had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Ah, okay. And gotcha. uh, she was on, on thyroid replacement. And uh, the interesting thing about her is um, she, I, she is not my patient, was not my patient. She, somebody handed her the book. Uh -huh. And she, she's clearly struggled with weight. Mm -hmm. So she, uh, she came out on one of, the, one of the shows and everybody noticed that she was you know, a whole lot thinner. She'd lost 40 pounds. And she said, oh, you know, it's all because of the plant paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, my Hashimoto's is gone too. And I'm off right. the thyroid medication. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that just, uh, wow. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she'd get on Twitter and she'd say, everybody thinks, you know, I'm seeing some diet doctor and I'm taking these weird supplements. And she said, no, you know, I just read the dumb book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What a great story. But would yeah. you say for weight loss, like what percentage are you seeing this diet you know, benefit weight loss because, you know, we've got those patients where they're past that point, right? It's really, really hard for them to reverse sort of the train that started. Are you seeing this helpful for them as well? Well, yeah, I actually, it's interesting. I got started um, more as a weight loss doctor than an immune doctor. And what I found was that there was really substantial evidence on how lectins and leaky gut promotes weight gain. And as I proposed in my, I've had mul multiple bestsellers, uh, New York Times bestsellers, but in my last New York Times bestseller, The Longevity Paradox, one of the things I proposed, which I first proposed in my research at Yale, there has to be a good reason why you adapt uh, new foods. And one of the reasons for adapting grains and beans are not that they're storageable, not that you can control their growth, but you wanna find a food that for any given calorie, you will be able to store as much fat as possible because mm -hmm. quite frankly, up until the last hundred years, our biggest worries were starving to death. Right. And so if you found foods that prompt the storage of fat for any given amount of calories, that food would win. And so the, the research that had been done showed that the lectins in grains and beans were in fact one of the best ways to actually facilitate fat storage by lectins attaching to insulin receptors on fat store fat cells and actually flipping the switch to constantly push sugar into fat cells. And um, fascinating. That, and huh. so I think we chose the and and we know that we know that people were actually sick eating grains and beans. We actually shrunk dramatically mm -hmm. uh, after grains and beans were introduced. We were actually quite tall people. Um, up until about 12,000 years ago. Tall and muscular. I mean, Tall we and muscular. Were, Lean, and, mean, I know. big we brains. In, we have had 15%. Have um, you been to the Colosseum in Rome? I think the message there as, as to how much we've changed hit me there because they were showing us the steps. And, you know, the steps are very narrow and it's almost like you could just run up them very quickly. And they were like, yeah, we used to have more leg power. We used to be longer, stronger. But here's the, here's the thing, like what does the average person do out there 
they're like, okay, well, what about the impossible burger? And what about going vegan? Like that's the thing right now, but to go vegan, you're going to eat a bunch of grain and you're going to eat a lot of beans or bean derivatives or bean products. You know, what do you do? Or somebody like, you know, my husband's family who's like, well, we've eaten lentils and chickpeas and you know, nightshades yep. as a, as a routine, you know, they don't eat meat. So what do they do? So how does, how do you reconcile sort of the conflicting information that's out there with right. the trend today's trend of going vegan and, and finding vegan substitutes for everything? That's a great question. And, you know, because of my experience at Loma Linda, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, I'm the only nutritionist who's actually ever lived most of his career in a blue zone. Mm -hmm. And I have multiple people attack me, uh, even though I'm the only one who's ever lived in a blue zone uh, and spent their career there. Uh, Because of that, I see a a large number of vegan and vegetarian patients. And for the most part, uh, some of them are some of the sickest patients that I encounter and often have multiple autoimmune diseases. Having said that, I am pro-plant. I am a plant predator. Mm -hmm. Uh, If anyone's Mm -hmm. ever eaten with me, uh, they know I just love to eat plants. But you got to know who your friends are and who doesn't want you to eat them. And we evolved from great apes that ate 16 pounds of leaves every day and leaves we've evolved our immune system has evolved to understand the lectins and leaves our gut microbiome evolved to handle the lectins and leaves so getting back to your question uh, the problem with so much of our diet currently is not so much that oh we should be eating beans or we should be eating grains but our defense system against lectins, which used to be robust, we used to have this incredible vast array of microbiome, which was very interested in eating lectins. There are bacteria that love gluten, for instance, Mm -hmm. Uh, but we've wiped out this defense system against lectins because of the antibiotics we take and the antibiotics in all of our food. And don't get me started, glyphosate Roundup was patented as an antimicrobial. And we forget that at our peril. And one of the best ways to kill off your microbiome is to eat glyphosate-laden food. And it's in everything. It's in all of our wheat. It's all of our corn, all of our oats, uh, all of our soybeans. It's, Mm It's in all of our canola. It's everywhere in California red wine. Um, So our defense system against lectins has been just decimated. And that's the other point of the plant paradox that the seven deadly disruptors, and we won't bore your listeners with all of them, but so those are several of them. Is this a a U.S. issue or is this a worldwide issue? So it is a U.S. issue, but it's becoming rapidly a worldwide issue. The EU, uh, now that Bayer owns Monsanto, has approved Monsanto uh, Roundup for use. Mm -hmm. There's some pushback. Uh, Belgium this year will ban Roundup. Germany, I think in 2021, will ban Roundup. I have so many, and I write about this, I have so many of my autoimmune patients who are cured or go into remission on my program. And then uh, they go over to Europe and they eat the breads, the croissants, the (laughs) the beans, and they don't, um, they don't flare. And they, they come back and they say, this is great. You know, I'm still cured. Now I can eat anything I want. And they eat our breads, our pastas, our yogurts, and they flare. Yeah. And they go, what happened? And I think we, we've got a, lay that at how our food is grown and round up. Um, So, and I see that all the time as well. And it's so frustrating for folks. They say that like the minute they land on us soil, everything comes like rushing back. So, so I have a, I, I know we're running short of time here. I have one 
nerdy doctor question and then one question that I'm hoping everybody out there can actually take and use. So with all this autoimmune disease uh, weight, which I think is ultimately an autoimmune disease too, yes. and you see the lectin removal calming the immune system down, for physicians like myself who are measuring stuff, like I'm measuring crazy stuff, IL-6s, you know, mm -hmm. TGF betas, all this other stuff. Is, yep. there, is there a marker that you like to use to monitor, I'm fascinated by the immune system, to monitor the immune system and the toning down of the immune system out of all the different markers that we have available? Is there something that you've just seen super reliable? Well, and it also really depends on, on the labs that you're using. Um, I was using a lab that had a very accurate measure of TNF-alpha, mm -hmm. and I found TNF-alpha to be very useful for looking at actually leaky gut and the presence of lectins in, in the diet, and I actually published a paper in the American Heart on that. Uh, more recently, uh, IL-16 has gotten my attention, yep. mm -hmm. and I've published two papers on IL-16 IL is a very good marker for an autoimmune attack on the surface of blood vessels, the endothelial mm. surface of blood vessels, when lectins are present in the diet, and when we remove them, IL-16 plummets. So I count IL-16 right now. Okay. I think there are better and better tests for leaky gut. Um, I think we were uh, naive to think that measuring zonulin was a mm -hmm. good measurement of leaky gut. Certainly, in my experience, anti-zonulin and anti-actin mm -hmm. far better of leaky gut. Uh, Anti-LPSs are useful as well, but you don't have to have leaky gut to have anti-LPSs. LPSs are lipopolysaccharides, what I call little pieces of shit uh, in the book. <laughs> Much I, easier to understand. <laughs> yeah, they're pieces of bacteria. They're bacteria cell wall. I <laughs> love it. Um, and I was naive early on years ago that you could cure leaky gut in maybe a couple of weeks. Certainly, we see really good response in three months, six months. Some people take nine months to mm -hmm. get all the markers of leaky gut resolved. And, uh, and you can measure these. Um, most of the time, insurance, unfortunately, doesn't cover it. Right. Um, but it's, you know, it's worth like Looking. tracking and checking and tracking yeah yeah i love it um and then for anybody out there who's listening and who is taking all of this in and maybe getting a bit confused are you supposed to be vegan vegetarian paleo gluten-free lectin-free or whatever else how would you tell them to start what would you say is if you gave them maybe three action items three things that they could start to do how would you direct them uh, so the first thing you want to do is party like it's 9,999 <laughs> years ago. Take it all in. Everything. <laughs> you, actually, if, if you eat like our ancestors ate 10,000 years ago, you will, you will do just great. Our, our ancestors were big, tall, healthy, muscular people who were not fat, and they didn't eat these modern foods, number one. Uh, eat as if all of us in America are not from America. We're Asian, African, or European. And mm -hmm. so we have to remember that none of our ancestors were exposed to North or South American foods until 500 years ago when mm -hmm. Colombian trade started. So don't eat peanuts, don't eat cashews, don't eat quinoa, uh, don't, eat the, don't eat the nightshades, they're, they're American. Right. Goji berries, by the way, came from America. They were called the wolf berry, and they were taken to China and trade. Huh. Uh, yeah, they're, they're an American food. So those are, those are actually easy things to do. We were never designed to eat these things. And that's a place to start. The other thing is, please, please, please take vitamin D. And don't be afraid of it. Uh, a University of California, San Diego paper showed that the average American should take 9,600 international units of vitamin D a day. And that they found that 30,000 international units a day could not produce vitamin D toxicity. Wow. So we should not be afraid of vitamin D. And don't listen to a well-meaning physician who, when you get a vitamin D level of 60, going, oh my gosh, you're toxic, you've got to stop it. And I see that all the all time. All the time, yeah. 
Well, great advice, such informative stuff. I'm sure all of you out there listening today agree. What an incredible career as well. Just really a role model for all of us out there trying to, trying to do it. So thank you so much for taking the time today to join us. I really appreciate it. If anyone wants to connect with you or you know, just really pick your brain more, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? So you can go to uh, drgundry.com. Um, you can go to gundrymd.com. I've got two YouTube channels. Listen to the Dr. Gundry podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Um, um, that's how you can. Lots of opportunities, Lots guys. Of so if you have an autoimmune disease, if you're suffering from a weight issue, if you have inflammation, leaky gut, all these things that we talk about so often on the show. This is a resource for you that is unparalleled. So check him out. Check out the book, The Plant Paradox. He has others as well. And thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. For everybody else, thank you so much for joining this episode of Superwoman Wellness, which remember, it's on Spotify as well. So please rate and review it and share it with your friends. I will see you guys all next time. Mm -hmm.